a lot of people are like, Matt, that's not legal. I can't use my IRA to buy real estate. I can't use my IRA to invest in an LLC that owns real estate. I have my account at Fidelity and they said all I can buy is stocks and mutual funds. Well, that's not because IRAs can't do it. That's because Fidelity IRAs can't do it, you know? Like they're a broker dealer. You can buy what they sell. We have Matt Sorensen on the show today. He's an attorney, founder, and CEO of Directed IRA. He's also the co-host of Main Street Business with Mark Kohler, who's also been on the show. So I'm really excited to have Matt on the show. He is a personal finance expert, like I said. So we're going to talk about so many interesting things. But first, I want you to get to know the man behind Matt Sorensen. So tell us a little bit about who you are, Matt, and how'd you get into the financial world? Well, thanks for having me, Kayla. First, it's an honor being on your podcast. Um, I'm a podcaster too, so I love this format and being able to chat and learn. You know, I mean, I was like a broke teen dad, basically. I got I got married and my first kid when I was 18. Wow. Um, And I had like the school of hard knocks, like no family support, you know? So I just had to like figure it out with my wife at the time. And we were just, you know, learning about personal finance and like how to like pay your bills. I mean, like cover a budget, you know? And then I get through like, you know, buying a home and investing in real estate and being an entrepreneur and being a partner in a law firm and founding a company and, you know, and I have, we have 25 million in combined revenue, hundred plus employees. We've got a lot going on now, but there was a turning point when I was an attorney for a couple of years where I'm like, I don't know that I like billing hours every day forever. Mm. And, you know, being an attorney is a great way to make money. I'm like, it's the hardest way to make money, I think, <laughs> to make good money. <laughs> so I was trying to figure a way to do a business and did some things that worked, some things that didn't, but I eventually got to Directed IRA, which is my passion and my love and what I do. And I wrote the number one book in the field. So that's the Reader's Digest version. I'm like, man, I'm going to cut this off quick, but that's the, the gist of it. Well, yeah, you went through that very fast. So it's like, you just kind of figured it out as you went. And I like to point that out because so many people, they look at successful entrepreneurs and they think you were handed like a manual or a guide on day one and you just followed yeah. it step by step. People always ask like, well, what's the next step? I'm like, I don't know, figure it out like for yourself, right? So take me back to that mindset of you being 19, 20 years old and like reading the books and doing the things to become who you are today. Okay, well, that was about learning discipline because I was a punk kid in high school and I worked full time. I was a dad, like my daughter, my oldest daughter, Brooklyn at the time. I mean, she's now 25, you know, off doing great things, but she was in a bassinet in the bathroom because we had a studio apartment. That's all we could afford. Wow. They'd pull her out in the morning into the kitchen so I could take a shower, put, you know, roll her back in. And then I'd go to school. Then I'd go work full-time job. Then I'd go back to school. So Tommy, like discipline and hard work was the first thing like at that young age, but that's like the best thing that ever happened to me. Right. Being an entrepreneur you know, a lot of people, they, they see the social media of it and like, oh, this is great. This is fun. I'm chasing my dream. I'm getting financial freedom. Oh, you can have that, but you're going to pay a price to get there. And you got to be willing to have the discipline, willing to pay the price to get there. Because when you start a company, you know what I mean? Like your HR, your IT, your customer service, your sales, you're the cleaning company. You're like everything, right? And it can be stressful and tough. And you got to learn a lot of rules, rules and do a lot of things. And so that discipline of hard work being like the teen dad was something that today I'm still like super grateful for. And it's just like driven my work ethic and how I approach things. And didn't your oldest daughter, did she graduate with a finance degree? Is that what I saw? Yeah. So she was like, you know, summa cum laude finance graduate, president of women in business, had a small business in high school, selling hats online. She sold like 30,000 hats. <laughs> She's now an investment banker at, in Wall Street. It's called Jeffrey's a big investment banking firm. So yeah, I mean, that's these, that amazing. the daughter I'm rolling out the bassinet, you know, at 18 years old. Yeah. But she really saw that, that work ethic. And I think that yeah. transfers over to our kids, that discipline, like when they see their parents disciplined, it just becomes a habit for them. They don't know laziness. So I mean, yeah. I, I don't want to speak for every parent because I know sometimes <laughs> things happen. Right. Um, but at least that's what I see with my kids too. And I think people don't realize how much discipline it takes and how much sacrifice it takes to build 
a thriving business and like also an investment portfolio on top of that, right? Because right, it takes yeah. a lot of discipline to not spend your money <laughs> to, to exactly. be a good saver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's hard too, you know? And I think what I learned, you know, I was kind of like forced into it in many ways, but it was like, kids don't do what you tell them. They do what you do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And if they see you working or doing things at home on the weekends and inv involving in those things, like one of the best things I did, this is a funny story just about kids, you know, but it's like, so my daughter, my two oldest daughters, it's so my second daughter. She's a senior in college right now. And so I would make them do a garage sale every summer for years. And I love this because I would sit back and do nothing. I gave them all the stuff that they could sell, frankly, stuff I was going to get rid of anyways, right? And I said, you get to keep half the money. The other half, it's like taxes, okay? <laughs> and I'm the government and you got to pay me, okay? But the rest you get to do for yourself. So my oldest daughter, she's a little older, two years older. So they would go out and sell and people would come to the garage sale. I didn't help. I would not help anyone. I like hung out in the garage and would like check on to make sure they were okay, but I would not talk to anybody. They had to negotiate. They had to talk to people. They had to sell the stuff. They'd collect the money. You know, they did great. That's but awesome. my, uh, my oldest daughter, it's funny. She got her friends were all like excited and wanted to help her. And I'm like, and she's like, I've got this one friend who wants to come over. She wants me to pay her. And I'm like, do whatever you want. I told her. So she had negotiated a cut of whatever she sold. Then this other friend was like, well, my mom wants me to sell this stuff. So she brought stuff over my, and my daughter like negotiates like, well, since I'm doing all the work and I got all the signs out and everything, I'm going to take half of the, whatever you sell, but you can bring it over. She's like cutting all these deals. I didn't even tell her anything. You know, she's just like figuring this out, doing a freaking garage sale, you know, but like, I wasn't doing that. I mean, I was doing it to get rid of my crap out of my house, not to make money, but to like teach them how to do stuff. And I think as parents, that's one of the things, sometimes we think about practical things that for our kids to do, like they got to unload the dishwasher. They got to mow the lawn because that's got to get done. Sometimes you got to engineer stuff that can really teach them, mm. give them a valuable lesson. You know, you could use the garage sale thing, but I'm totally but stealing that's, that. That's, I think, a, a valuable tool. Yeah. You should use it. It's fun. Yeah. I wonder if my HOA will allow it. Now I need to go check You know in. what? That's a great lesson. Just do it and let's see what happens and let your kids learn that lesson. <laughs> Ask for forgiveness after the fact. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? That's perfect. If they're going to come bust some like teenage kids, you know, doing a garage sale, come on. <laughs> Even well, in Del Boca Vista, you know, I don't think they'll do that. Well, I love that. So, you know, it's, it's that old parable of like, if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for life. Right. So it's, it's about teaching our kids yeah. and you're doing that on your podcast. You're teaching people around the world how to, you know, direct their retirement savings. And I watched this reel that you did the other day where you talked about the 4% rule. Can you talk to me about the 4% rule when it comes to your retirement? Well, one thing, the 7% the rule is basically something that will, you can figure out how long does it take for your investment to double. If you're getting a 10% return, for example, in seven years, your investment will double. So if you're like, well, I got a 50,000 portfolio, 10% return in seven years, you basically have to divide whatever you're trying to get at the end by seven. Okay. So that'll tell you how long it's going to take to get there. So 10% is easy because it's divided by 10, that's seven years. So, cause we're divided by seven. So let, let's say you're getting 10% on an investment, $50,000. It's going to double to a hundred thousand dollars in seven years. Well, then another seven years, that hundred thousand is going to double to 200,000. And so this, this compounding growth factor of well, now I doubled my money, but now that money doubles on top of what recently doubled. And, and you keep getting that, yeah, you keep getting that compounding growth. And it's hard when you're your first few years into that, right? Especially if you're in the stock market and it's like up and down and you can't make sense of it. The people that do it for 10 years and are consistent, a lot of people are super surprised. It's like, oh my gosh, my account's this big, you know, or, or my assets have grown this large. My real estate holding portfolio and the net worth is X amount. Because they've had the, the time value of that money and that growth and that compounding value working in their favor. Mm -hmm. I love that little equation that people can do because I'm a very, uh, I'm a big dreamer, but then also at the same time, numbers don't lie. Yeah. And so when you can mix those two together and you just know, okay, this is the formula I need to follow. This is how much I need to invest now in order to have that, you know, in seven to 10 years from now. So I'm obsessed mm -hmm. with, you know, really investing in real estate because I think you can double your money a lot quicker if you, if you get in on the right deals. Sure, yeah. 
So between your, you know, your business directed IRA, your book, the content you put out on your podcast and on YouTube, you know, you do a ton of educating around how retirement accounts like Mm -hmm. IRAs and 401ks can help people invest in real estate. Can you kind of walk us through the process? If there's somebody listening in, listening in right now that might have an IRA, you know, with Fidelity or Vanguard, one of the bigger ones, and they're currently watching it go like, like this in growth (laughs) or not even like this, it's like this. What can they do to start investing in real estate? So yeah, I love real estate too, you know, and, and even being like an attorney, making a good living partner in a law firm, starting my own business, like the first million bucks I made was in real estate, you know, and that, that was just growing net worth and buying real estate, holding it, turning stuff into rentals. And I'm, I'm a real estate investor outside of my retirement account. Let me say that. But let me just say, Wall Street has fooled you, okay, into thinking that your IRA and 401k is, can only be invested in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, your IRA can own a duplex. It can own a single family rental down the street. It could flip a property and make profit. And the same rules of when I use my IRA to buy Coca-Cola stock or Facebook or Apple stock and I sell it and make profit, goes back into my retirement account, don't pay taxes, it's building for my long-term wealth. The same rules work for real estate. You know, if I go buy a property and flip it, buy it for hundred grand, sell it for 150, that whole 150 goes back into my IRA, I don't pay taxes. And so we can use these same retirement account tools we're familiar with for Wall Street products, but you can use it for stuff you like, Kayla, like real estate, you know, like I like, that's actually what my own retirement accounts invested in is real estate. And so these assets have always been out there. You can own it. I'm not talking about like a REIT or some public. I'm talking about literally the rental property around the corner you Mm -hmm. could own in your IRA. How does it work if somebody like right now, I, I have a lot of people learning how to flip inside of one of my programs and they might have access to a retirement account. How do they become the lender on like, let's say they want to do a bridge loan or a flip. How does that happen with your IRA? Love this. Love this. Because see, there's people that want to use their retirement account to buy real estate and do a deal. Mm -hmm. They want to flip it. They want to do a buy and hold rental and have their IRA or 401k on that. There's other people though, like like you said, they're like, eh, don't want to do real estate, but I want to be the bank. Mm -hmm. I want to lend other investors money. And I just, I'll be the hard money lender, all fund for the acquisition or the rehab or both. And so we have tons of clients at Directed IRA, that's our company, that use their IRA just to be a private money lender. And that example I gave, that that seven, that rule of seven rule, you know, where your account can double is, I mean, I have a client, I remember this was probably 10 years ago, I started working with them. He had about a uh, 600,000, 700,000 old 401k he rolled over. All he's done is private money lending. His account's over to worth over 10 million now. Wow. He's not done anything else, but he can get a 12% annual return on his money because he's getting 10% interest. He's getting two points. A lot of times he loans that money out twice a year. So he's actually getting four points through the year, which is increasing his rate of return anyway. So, so if you want to just be like the bank, you can absolutely do that. And so a lot of times I'm telling people, guys, if you don't care about having an IRA, by the way, 10% of US household net worth is in IRA accounts, not 401ks. And that's another percentage of net worth, but 10% of us household net worth is in IRAs. If you're like Matt, Caleb, I don't care about having an IRA, but I love real estate. Okay. Do you want to get your deals funded? You know, it's more likely if you need to get a, a loan on a rehab on a property, someone's going to have a hundred grand, 200 grand in their IRA, than they're going to have in a personal savings account. There's $35 trillion in us retirement accounts. It's like knowing how that strategy works, you can access that money is huge. I'm sitting at this desk here. I'm in like our podcast studio with the client. Sorry, I'm going on a rant here. I love it. Keep going. I was sitting at this desk here. (laughs) Okay. With a client of mine, we did a webinar. He's a flipper here in Phoenix, flipped a lot of houses. Great guy. He's on 250 deals here in the Phoenix area in the last five years. He said 60% of those are funded by IRAs because he just knows the strategy and he knows that's where the money's at. And it, and, and so I love that strategy for people because it's a win-win. There's some real estate out there investor that needs money to do a deal, right? And there's also somebody's IRA out there that they're bent, that it's in a crappy mutual fund they don't even like. And they want to invest in real estate too and be the lender. So it's just like perfect win-win scenario. Everybody can 
can come off winning, making money. But also, you know what? Somebody got a great property rehab too. What are the legalities of somebody that is, you know, going to go either buy an asset or with their IRA or going to just be the private money lender? Are there any? Yes. So great question. The, the there's a couple things to say on that. So, well, I have my book, you know, the self-directed IRA handbook. Okay. We need to sell that. sold 40,000 copies sold. It's the number That's one amazing. book in the space. It's, you know, if you got like the engineer that asks you a million questions or the lawyer client or, you know, investor, just get on my book. I got like a hundred legal citations, but there's two things I want to say on that. The first is a lot of people are like, Matt, that's not legal. I can't use my IRA to buy real estate. I can't use my IRA to invest in an LLC that owns real estate. They're like, I have my account at Fidelity. And they said, all I can buy is stocks and mutual funds. I called Fidelity and I said, Hey, I want to buy a rental property or flip a property with my IRA. And they said, I couldn't do it. Well, that's not because IRAs can't do it. That's because Fidelity IRAs can't do it. You know, <laughs> like they're a broker dealer. Yeah, they want to keep you your can money. buy what they sell. <laughs> exactly. They, you, it's like you showed up at McDonald's and you asked for a roast beef sandwich. You know, you can have a roast beef sandwich. You're not getting it at McDonald's <laughs> as far as I know. So, so you just got to go to a different place. So your IRAs always been able to own real estate under the laws is my first point. The problem was the financial services companies, which dominate IRA and 401k accounts, are typically broker dealers that are incentivized for you to sell you investments that they sell. So you need to move your account from, let's say, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade to a company like ours, Directed IRA. And there's like 30 other banks or trust companies like ours that do this. We're the best. But so that's step one is just need to get to a provider that lets your IRA own real estate, mm -hmm. which is you've always been able to do since retirement accounts are around in the 70s. The number one legal rule, though, that people screw up is what's called the prohibited transaction rule. It's like four chapters in my book. Basically, it's a rule that the, that the Congress created that says, we don't trust you. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. It's like, we don't trust you. We've created these retirement accounts with like Roth accounts that when you make money in it, it grows and comes out totally tax-free at retirement, right? Like my largest client has a 300 million Roth IRA. You know, this is a, this is a, an account that he makes money and he pays no tax at all, right? He's actually 59 and a half already now. He can pull it out whenever he wants. He pays zero tax. And because it's got this sweet tax incentive, they didn't want you to transact with people that they don't, tr your account trust, they don't trust your account with like yourself. So I can't use my IRA to buy real estate from myself, or I can't use my IRA to buy real estate I'm going to go live in. So you've got to transact with third parties. Um, or more distant family members. So it's called the prohibited transaction. So basically your account can't transact with certain restricted people. That includes yourself, your spouse, for people in Utah, that's all your spouses, your kids, you know, your parents. So they're like on the naughty list, so to speak, don't transact your account, but everyone else is fair game, mm -hmm. you know? And so as long as you're not trying to benefit yourself or do a deal yourself with your IRA, you're going to be okay. Okay. So for someone that's hearing this, maybe for the first time that they can use their retirement money to invest. I know for me, I just heard of this a year ago and I was like, mind blown. Yeah. What? Oh my gosh. It's so cool. You know, right. and they're, they're picturing putting all the chips on the table. So taking everything out of their current accounts and putting it into some real estate, maybe not one asset, but multiple, yeah. whatever. They're pulling it all out. How risky is it mm -hmm. to invest this way? Well, I mean, there's risk in all investments. Right. I mean, right. You could be in the stock market that's down 20, 30%. You could have owned stock in Signature Bank or Silicon Valley Bank or, I, you know, I don't know. But the thing with real estate, the reason I like it and why I invest in it myself, I'll just speak for myself, is it doesn't go to zero. You know, like you might buy at a high time in the market and you could maybe lose some money if you need to sell and you can't hold out. But real estate over time has always gone up. But Within real estate, the stock market, all other investment categories, there's good assets and bad. But the one unique thing about real estate is it's a physical asset and property, unlike a company that can go to zero. So, so that's one thing that kind of reduces the risk, I think, in real estate. But my message has always been invest in what you know. Like if you know the stock market and you're a wizard of the stock market, I'm telling you invest in the stock market. But if you don't love the stock market, you've done poorly in it, and you love and know real estate, you should invest in real estate. And why would you not have your IRA invested in it too? So our message is typically invest in what you know. I mean, I have a client who's a, a 
really big tech investor invests in tech startup companies with their IRA. I had a, a client invest in a Mexican soccer team with their IRA. You know, we've had clients own livestock with their retirement accounts. You know, I've had a client own a share of a racehorse at the Kentucky Derby with their IRA, you know? So like these are assets you can all own, but just invest in what you're good at and what you know, which could be real estate, could be horse racing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is there's risk in everything. There is. And I think part of becoming an investor, you don't realize that when you just have your retirement fund just going and, and working, you don't feel the risk necessarily. And when you start to go and choose what the investments are, it's scarier in the beginning because you haven't done it yet. But you know, it's just like with anything, once you do it a couple of times, it's just like riding a bike. Um, you know, you get better and better at it and you start to, absolutely, yeah, you start to pick winners and the more educated and competent you become, the more empowered you're going to be around those investments. So you're putting skin in the game. Like you said, you are into real estate, but what are your own like personal investing goals right now? Mm, personal investing goals. Well, I, I mean, my number one investment is my business. I'll be honest, you know, that directed IRA has been a super successful company. We've grown fast. It's been, an, I got an amazing team here. And so that's like my number one investment, which is taking my time. It took a little bit of money and I had to go raise some money too, but that, that is my number one investment. And I'm trading my time for that, you know, in terms of investing my money, you know, I'm looking, I'm actually looking at multifamily property right now. Not because I, I think some people uh, glamorize that a little too much, frankly, but there's some reasons I'm, I'm looking at that with my spouse, but um, I do private money lending right now with my retirement account. I'm a guy that firmly believes in base hits. Have, have you seen the movie Moneyball? No. Brad Pitt, mm -mm. Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill. No. Okay. Do me a favor. Kayla. You got to watch Moneyball. Okay. Okay. I'll add that to There's the to-do list. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going ex to explain a scene in the movie that teaches not about baseball, but about investing. And this is my investing philosophy. Okay. Okay. You got, so there's Brad Pitt. He's like the, the general manager of the team, right? He's the boss of the Oakland athletics. This is a true story. It's based on a true story. Okay. Okay. So you got a Brad Pitt story. I mean, okay. I'm interested. Okay. We got Jonah Hill who's like this nerdy intern scout kind of guy. Okay. And they're in this room of all these other scouts for the baseball team. And Jonah Hill's like the new kid in there. Brad Pitt's the big boss. It's all these other scouts and they're trying to pick players. And the Oakland athletics were like a pretty good team on a very low budget. Okay, that was like the history of them. And they lost some of their big players. So they had to go get new players. There's a point to this on it. I swear. I'm imagining <laughs> it right here. Going? Yes. Okay. All right. So. They're going around the room and all these guys, other scouts are throwing out like big popular names that are big home run hitters. And Brad Pitt's like, we can't afford them. We can't afford them. We can't afford them. And he goes over to Jonah Hill and he says, who are we going to pick? And, he, and they throw some names up on the board. And Brad Pitt po points at Jonah Hill and he says, and why are we going to get them? He says, because they get on base. And he goes through this whole thing of, well, how do you score runs in a baseball game? You get on base. What were these guys unique about these guys that they picked? They walked. Mm -hmm. They weren't home run hitters, but they got on base. And at the end of the day, this Jonah Hill was like some stat nerd from Yale that figured out you don't really need home run hitters. There's value in just getting guys that can freaking walk and get on base because getting on base ends up scoring runs. So, so the point of it, and this is from an investing philosophy, is I'm not trying to hit home runs. I'm just trying to get on base, get base hits. And as I've been able to work with a lot of successful investors over my career, that's what they do. They just consistently get on base and they, they keep putting more and more money. They deploy more and more money. They keep it invested. They don't take chips off the table. They don't sell their real estate. If you're a real estate investor, I, I remember one client, he's like, why would I ever sell? He's like, I already own the asset. I've done the work. I'm just buying more, buying more, buying more. And so, so I just like base hits. And I think some people get stuck because they're trying to hit home runs right. that they don't even get up to bat. They don't even do anything. They don't even save because they're, they think they need to hit a home run. Just get on base. Let time work. I am obsessed. I wish I would have seen Moneyball 15 years ago, but you know, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I think when I first started my investing journey, like 12 years ago, I was all about the home runs, like looking for all yeah. like the, what I like to call like um, gambling now because <laughs> you could very much like lose <laughs> yeah. that money. And so I love that yeah. you're calling it base hits because 
it's really like looking for those things that aren't sexy, right? That are just like, oh, okay, they're rinse and repeat situations. Like we kind of know, I like to call it like a vanilla situation. Like we know exactly what we're going to get. We know exactly what it's going to taste like, no matter what the brand is, it's going to taste vanilla. And those are the types of investments I like to make now because I don't like to lose money. (laughs) Right. And, And they're safer. Like that's the thing. Like it's this, the same thing of like, in order to hit a home run, you got to swing big mm-hmm. and you can strike out. You know what I mean? And this is like this analogy, I can go forever on this, but you know, even like my last rental, my last property, I sold a property in my retirement account uh, six months ago. I mean, this was a rental that I bought in Indianapolis for 80, 85, $84,000. I sold it for 170. Wow. And I owned it about four years. It was a pretty awesome return. I only put down 40 grand, by the way, I got a loan for the balance. So I had a $40,000 investment that yielded me. What did I get off of that? I had my bet of 40 I and mean, I, I got back like 140 grand return on a 40,000 investment, yeah. you know? And so that was a great return. But if you looked at this property, it was the dumpy rental in Indianapolis. I shouldn't say dumpy average rental in Indianapolis and it cash flowed. The numbers were great. It wasn't some sexy, cool town. It wasn't some beautiful, gorgeous property that you're going to post on Instagram. But you know what? It made money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the type of base hitting stuff. Because sometimes when you're just trying to hit a base hit, you end up hitting a triple. You know, I'd call that one a triple. It was a good one, you know. And so now my money's out doing private money lending from that deal. But That's awesome. So that's, that's I think, just a little principle on Okay. Base hits. Okay. Well, I have a multifamily in Arcadia in your name, like in that little area that you're in. So you want to talk about it later? (sighs) Yeah. So look. Okay. All right. Let's chat. (laughs) Let's talk about entrepreneurship. (laughs) You have over a hundred employees. And I think that's what takes people like, you know, entrepreneurs, we have dreams and we have goals and big, big visions. But sometimes when it comes to like actually like making it happen, and like scaling, yeah. we can sabotage because yeah. nobody taught us how to like, you know, build out a team. And obviously you've learned how to do mm-hmm. that and do that really well. So yeah. regardless of the size of the team, what is like one universal mm. skill business owners should focus on to lead their team effectively? Okay. The one skill, and this is going to sound like a dodge a little bit, but that there's a lot of reasoning to this adaptability. When you're growing a business, different versions of yourself are more important at different stages of your growth. When you're starting out and it's just you, you do need to be everything. Like I said earlier, your sales, your IT, your accounting, your finance, you know, you're freaking the cleaning person, you know, you're everything. And that has some benefits because the buck stops there. You know, everything that's going on in the business, you can make an impact on everything, you know, but I'll tell you that style of running a business does not work at a hundred employees. Right. And from one, when I kind of say you get like the five to 10, you need to start adapting at five. First, you got to get a few employees and get used to having employees being clear on what their role is, what the team's goals are going to be. What is winning in our organization? What is winning as a team? A lot of people skip that. Like their employees don't know what that is. They come to work, but they're like, I don't even know what we're doing. What's, how are we winning every day? Like Mm. what's good, you know, but then you get up to like 10 employees and you have to start having some leadership besides yourself. You know, you've got to have a leader or two that can help you grow. But eventually once you get to like where I'm at now, and then you go to adapt again. And now you've got people, you don't know their names that work for you. You know, their manager kind of, you know, you might know the, the manager's manager a lot better, your executive leadership team. But where I'm at right now, where I've been like the last year or two really is I've gotten to a point where I've realized my role is to recruit and train my executive leadership team and to start finding people smarter than me. You get into this little bit of a complex and a lot of entrepreneurs do this where they think that they're the smartest person in the room on everything. <laughs> and you are going to hold yourself back you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make dumb decisions. You are, the, you're sometimes the person, the most out of touch of what's going on in your business. Cause you're no longer on the front lines. Mm-hmm. When you were one to five employees, you knew everything that was going on. You knew what customers liked, you knew what they didn't like. You knew it was inefficient. You, you were, you were there at a hundred. You don't know. Mm-hmm. And you, so you got to trust these people. There's another, you got to adapt again to another version of yourself. 
Wow. Okay. Lots of adapting. I love that word though. It's about becoming who you need to be at every, you know, new evolution of your business exactly. and your, you know, destiny really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you don't, you get stuck. Yeah. You get stuck. Yeah. Have you ever felt mm-hmm. stuck in your business? Yes, because I wasn't willing to adapt. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I really, so it's like learning from your mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Well, every entrepreneur has ego. Let's be honest. Absolutely. You know, it takes a little bit of ego to start a business. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. It, you know, it takes a little bit of ego, but you've got to let it go to scale. The people I know that can't scale their business is just their ego that's in the way. It's not their business. It's not the strategy. It's their ego. They're not willing to get and pay for the right talent and people to get them to the next level. And so once you realize scaling is going to take other people, you know, I've seen some sayings out there, like you don't build a business, you build people and people build your business. That's super true. If you're trying to scale, because if you want to go 10 X, hundred X of what your business is, it's going to take people to do that. You're not working 10 times more than you're already working. So when you started directed IRA, you had a partner, Mark, right? Uh-huh. How did you guys choose to go into business together? Because it's like, you could like somebody, but you don't want to do business with them. But how did you know it was going to be a good partner? Yeah. <laughs> Well, the nice thing about Mark and I, we were partners in our law firm, you know, for 10, 15 years before that. Okay. So we have a law firm, you know, with about 60 employees in it. Uh, There's about 45 in directed IRA. The law firm has been around, Mark started in 2000. We became 50 50 partners in 2008. So that was a nice thing. And, And with Mark and I, and many people know, if you listen to our podcast, you know, or you've worked with us for like a one minute a lot of people quickly realize our relationship, you know, which is we have strengths and, and some people don't make partnerships work, but Mark and I have done a really good job because we complement each other. What Mark's good at, I'm not great at. And what I'm good at, he's not either. Like I can fill in a lot of his weaknesses within our business and organizations. And you know what? He fills in a lot of mine. And that for anyone who's thinking of partnering with someone in a business, You have got to have that because the power of that is like super unstoppable. I mean, think of all of the successful businesses out there from like, I don't know, like Microsoft, right? That was a partnership. Paul Allen and Bill Gates, you know, you got Steve Jobs and Bob Wozniak from Apple, you know, like there's like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, you know, all these like super large organizations now that had partnerships is you want to find someone that compliments you. So, and then Mark and I had bought real estate together and done some real estate investments together. So, you know, directed was easy. It's mostly my thing. Mark's a partner and it's kind of, Mark's got a lot of other things he does. He has a CPA firm I'm not part of and, you know, lots of other things, but, but directed Mark's a partner in it and co-founder of it, but it's kind of like my thing. And I take the role of like, this is my organization and my thing. And, but my partner, Mark, he has his role too. And I got some others on my executive team that have some equity too. So. If you're going to partner with someone, you don't want the same person as you mm-hmm. don't get this person because you're going to have conflict. Do I do this or do you do this? And it's so much nicer if you have different strengths. Mm-hmm. I think that is so huge to point out to people because just because somebody has a good skill or um, something that they bring a good network that they might bring to the table, it doesn't mean that they should be yeah. a partner in the business with you. They need to be able to compliment your vision is what you're saying, right? Like, so fill in the gap of where you're weak. Is that right? Yeah. And have like clarity on who, who has what role, Mm -hmm. you know, just as a lawyer, you know, and I don't practice law anymore, but you know, when I was back advising clients, we still have our law firm, KQS lawyers, by the way. Uh, Yes, I'm an affiliate. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So I appreciate that. We got a little shout out there, shameless plug, but I had a, had a lot of consults with partnerships that didn't work out. Um, and partners fighting. And one of the common denominators was there was no clarity on who was doing what, you know, they all thought about how they're going to split up the money, you know, but when it got down to it, it's like, well, who was doing what? I mean, I could be a simple thing as like flipping a property, like two people decide to go in together and flip a property. Okay. Who's communicating with the contractors? Okay. Who's putting more money in if you need it? Are you both putting money in or is one of you the money person? One of you is the work person. Whose credit's going to be on the line if we need to get credit? Yeah. Who's going to negotiate and deal with the agent when we sell the property? 
I, like just like a lot of little things. And, and I'm telling you, if you think both of you do it, none of you, neither one of you are doing right. it, you know, and you're going to be tripping all over each other. So it's nice to like get some clarity on who's going to do what, particularly in operating business. I mean, I gave the example of a flip, but particularly in an operating ongoing business. Yeah. I absolutely love that. It's good uh, medicine for me to hear right now because I'm going into business with my brother-in-law <laughs> and, but it's perfect. It's yeah. like, yay, it's confirmation because he doesn't want to ever be on video like ever. And, <laughs> and I'm like, that's what I do really well. <laughs> so it's perfect. And he's dealing with all the flips and all of the, the construction crews and all that kind of stuff. So absolutely love that advice. Exactly. See, so you're in your lanes, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like, sorry for all like the sports metaphor. I went from Moneyball, you know, but it's like, you don't need two centers on a basketball team. Right. That's where it starts <laughs> to crumble. You know, I, I remember I had a, yeah. um, I was coaching a business partnership and during the coaching, we decided that they needed to dissolve because it was both of them wanted to be the superstar. Mm. And it's like, you can't have two people that are both obsessed with that. Like it's a recipe for disaster. So yeah. they lost a lot of money yep. on that now. Okay. We've talked <laughs> about building out your team. How did you build up your company to have a billion in assets under administration in just three years? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm raising right now for my second fund. Um, and I know that's a little bit different, mm -hmm. but like, it's a, it's a lot, yeah. a lot of work to acquire that much money. I can only imagine a yeah. billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're at 1.5, 1.6 billion right now. That's amazing. Um, and, you know, we open about 30 new accounts a day you know, to give you, to give you an idea. So sometimes it was 40, 50. Do they mainly come from your podcast? No, they actually come from relationships. Okay. I'll be honest. Um, so, I mean, our clients come from all over. There's, there's people that follow the podcast, both the directed IRA and main street podcast, you know, Mark and I are out speaking a lot. Mark's got a big YouTube channel. It, that, that's like a lot of his role, right? Is like top of the mm -hmm. funnel marketing. Like he's on stage, like right now in Texas, speaking to a bunch of accountants and CPAs, you know, it's like perfect, you know? So it's like every, he's going to leave there and be like, oh my gosh, this guy's like, you know, amazing. And so, so we get some, we exposure and accounts there. But when I started the business, I, this is, this is, this was a kind of a revelation as we got into it. I was an attorney for like half of my industry, right? So I ended up becoming an expert in the field. I wrote the number one book in the field. I like have consulted government agencies, federal and state government agencies on self-directed retirement accounts. The National Association of My Space uses my book. Like I kind of became like a real expert in like this one thing. Okay. Outside of this, I'm pretty good, but I'm not great. In this, I'm really good because mm -hmm. I like, this is like my 10,000 hour type thing. So I was able to see what a lot of the good companies in my industry did and what, how they succeeded. And one thing that I, that was very compelling to me was relationships. If you can get relationships that send you business on an ongoing basis, once you build that, they just keep sending it. So for example, if I have an investment sponsor, someone that's always raising capital, somebody that does multifamily investing or commercial real estate or a private equity fund or a venture capital fund, they're always out there seeking investors. There's always people they run into that need IRAs. And who do they send them to? Us. And so we want to, where we've shifted is we're still trying to get everybody that's investing in retirement account, but um, for self-directing, we've gone after these relationships. And that's where more than half of our accounts come from now is relationships we've built with places where they've realized, oh my gosh, these guys are amazing. They have great service. They have a great team. Their fees are reasonable. They're experts in the field. We feel comfortable sending our customers over there. Because then they're going to send them the same people next year and the year after and the year after. We don't have to do new marketing. So, so these like kind of evergreen sources of business is what we're trying to build. And that's been a, a key part of success and something we're kind of doubling down on right now as we're in our this current year strategic plan. It's like building more of that. Okay. I love that. So, so it's relationship capital is more important sometimes mm -hmm. than like the actual, like, you know, dollar capital when it comes to scaling your yeah. business. And I think yes. a lot of people, they think, way to say it. they think the other way. Right. And if you just focus on relationships yeah. and doing what you said you were going to do, making sure that all of the referrals that come your way from those people that you have relationships with, if they get great results, they're going to keep bringing more people to you. But if something negative happens, that's also like, okay, we're going <laughs> to, yeah. 
that, that well's going to run dry. Right. So it's like constantly exactly. making sure people are getting good results. Exactly. So you have to be good at what you do because that, that strategy doesn't work. Like you can market the heck out of stuff to individual people and have a crappy business and they just don't know it till they get there. Right. <laughs> and so they've already paid, they're already here and they, now they realize it sucks. So that can work. But the strategy of like these centers of influence type thing and relationships, you're absolutely right. Like if you can't execute that relationship, it's going to be like, all right, not sending you my next person. Mm -hmm. And so our team knows that. And so like we, you know, if you, people can look us up, I mean, we've received over 500 five-star reviews on Google verified reviews in like four years. And that's like to us, a testament of what our customers think of us. That's how we try to operate the business is that everybody would be willing to give us that type of review and recommendation. And so you got to be able to really execute the business. And so everybody's going to have competitors in their space, no matter what you're doing. And so you've always got to be executing, providing a better service. In the end, I've always been like, our brand is what's going to win. If we can be the best at what we do, eventually everyone will find us. But these centers of influence, it's funny because you know, we get someone, for example, if we'll have someone invest in us in a random fund we've never heard of before, the XYZ private fund, you know, it's a real estate fund, whatever. Their investor relations person is almost always delighted with the, our process and service. They're always like, oh my gosh, you guys were the fastest, cleanest, because my investor had this done like 10 times faster than the last other companies I've used that do this. And they're like, can I send you all my other people? You know, I don't know, you don't even have to ask for it. They're like, they realize what you're doing. And now that person's going to send me someone next month, the next month, the next month. So that is something that's super scalable because that's like, that's the snowball effect, this compounding, whatever you want to call it. Like you just keep adding those relationships, keep, you know, executing on the service in a, in a positive way. You just have this like amazing force going forward that grows and scales your business. Now you just got to keep up with it because that's the other side is okay, you know, we hire an employee a month, you know, at least. And so you got to get people up to speed and train and incorporate it and part of your culture and, and making sure that, you know, you can keep up with this demand too, which has been a challenge also. And well, and that goes back to what you said is like hiring and paying for really, really good talent. Yeah. Because that's, that's what can mess up is if you're like, well, I want to skimp on the COO and then you realize your systems and your operating procedures are crap and people aren't getting the same service they were a year ago or whatever. Yeah. You're just hoping you get lucky, you know, by getting some, somebody, you know, at a lower pay. And I, I, that's for entrepreneurs, especially it's trying to scale and going from zero, you know, you've had to be thrifty, you've had to be conservative and, and I, and I get that. So, but once you get to a certain point, you where you're like, okay, I'm an organization now where I don't even know the people, all the people that work for me. I mean, I, I do, but sometimes I, I'm like, oh crap, what's your name again? But uh, you're going to need a top leadership team at a minimum and you should pay for that and figure out ways to incentivize them and keep them engaged on your team and maybe give them some equity, you know, like, like how are they going to stay in it for these hard times of scaling? Cause it's tough. Like scaling a, a business is super tough. There's a reason Venture companies, you know, that go, that get venture capital funding have like stock options, you know, there's a reason for that. They get them locked in. Yeah. Did you use a recruiting company to hire all your talent? Nope. Oh, I've done it. Yeah. For directed, I've done it like for my leadership team, I would say I've done it. It's, a, it's someone I knew. I plucked them out of where I've known them from. Now, lucky I'd been an attorney in the space or I was pretty well known in my, my little, again, this little niche industry. And so I picked like those people from people I already knew that I knew they had a track record. I knew they believed in me and what I was trying to do. And they understood the business too. They understood our business model. I grabbed some people from competitors, I frankly, pulled a couple people out of my law firm <laughs> that were like rising stars. There was uh, you know, one of my people was a guy I used to speak at his events. You know, he's one of, he had one of the biggest events in my industry I'd go speak at and recruited him too. And so it was people I saw something in that I knew they would be good. A recruiter can work. I just realized, oh my gosh, I've got a network. Right. You have people. I need to go tap that and go like ask. 
here's what I'm doing. Do you want to be part of this? Yeah, it goes back to the relationships or everything. So you've been building out like your relationships mm-hmm. for years and years and years. And then when it was time to scale, you already had the relationships in place. And I think that's important for entrepreneurs listening in right now. Even if you're in those beginning stages, it's like you have to get into the rooms where you're going to meet people and grow from being around them and constantly like building up that Rolodex or I mean, it's not a Rolodex yeah. anymore, but it's, you know, building up that relationship capital now. It's so important. Yeah. And I mean, and we use a lot of the common ways to get with job postings and different like recruiting tools, not an actual recruiter. We have HR people and stuff like that. And so we're doing that, but I'm just telling you, the most successful ones have been using relationships. Like even like, like and some of the entry level people, like it was my my daughter's roommate's boyfriend that I hired, you know, because <laughs> my daughter was like, daddy listens to your podcast. Would you hire the kid? Like he actually likes it, you know, and he's like a finance major or something, you know, financial planning major. It's like, okay, he's been awesome, you know? And so just, I kind of like pay attention. What I have to say is like for what you need and like, think of the people also let people know you're hiring too. Like that was another thing is, do people know that you're hiring and growing? Like sometimes people will come to you because they know, oh my gosh, your business is growing fast. You're hiring and looking for people. Like I know so-and-so and those sometimes are the best connections because they can vouch for that person. Right. You know, even if it's not someone you directly know for them to bring someone else a job, someone a job prospect, that takes a little bit of trust to do that. So sometimes you can a little one step removed, but like you used, used the word earlier, I'm going to start using that relationship mm-hmm. capital. It's super valuable. It is, it is super valuable as any entrepreneur. Yeah. We got to be intentional and just constantly growing it. So last question Mm -hmm. for you. I feel like I could ask a million more questions, but to wrap this all up, you have, you have so many successful ventures in your life. And I just want to know, like, what do the logistics look like for you to get it all done and, and be good at all of it? Yeah. Well, different, this is again, you have to adapt in different phases right now, because there's so much going on. It's about surrounding yourself with better people. Like I got people better than me at the things that they do, you know? And if you want to have success in the organization or your company, again, it's just going to come back to the people. I'm really good about strategy. I think if I have any strength or superpower myself, it's strategy knowing the decisions to make, where we're going to be in five years, where we're going to be in three, what we need to do in three months, what we need to do in six. And like, that's, that's my strength and superpower. It is not managing people. It's not motivating people. It's not running a budget. I mean, those things are critical in a business, but I got people that are way better at that than I am in my organization, you know? And so, so find the things that you're really good at and make sure that you're the one in the organization driving and owning that. Get the other people to do the things that they could do better than you and have the, you know, self-awareness and that little ego check that I'm not the best at everything. Let me get other people that can own that in my business and organization so it can be better than if I was doing it because you're not going to have time to do anything, everything anyways. But then also you have to kind of elevate people too. So within your organization, like another issue that we have here, and sorry, this is like all like like, oh, my employees are going to listen to this. And be like, oh, what does Matt think? You know, we- <laughs> They're going to learn. They're going to learn. <laughs> like, yeah. We have like a lot of people that have became managers in our organization, but they've never managed before. You know, they were just like the best at their job. And so they got promoted because we're growing so fast. And now there's five people that report to them. Well, they no one's trained them to be a manager before. And so we've had, we're like doing a little bit of a reset to be like, okay, we need management training. Mm -hmm. You know, we need a training plan for our managers. We need a manager playbook for our managers. They need to know how how to give a performance review. They need to know how to interview. You think people know how to do this, particularly you entrepreneurs out there who have done it yourself, you know, and you just picked it up on the fly and you had to learn. But let's be honest, the 10th interview in person you hired, you were way better at than the first one. And so realizing that, we've had to kind of go back a little bit and do a little kind of new manager training too, for a lot of our, our middle level managers Mm -hmm. and, and some business training too. Like how do you make a good business decision? A lot of new managers make a mistake because they're like, well, we should change a process and do this instead. Okay. That makes sense for your team. They can do, they don't have to do as much work, but you just push a bunch of crap on the customer and the client that now has to do something that your team just wanted, didn't want to do. 
Now, as a manager, some managers think, especially new ones, I did a great job. I helped my team not have to do X, Y, and Z paperwork because you just push it on the client. Now I've got a customer service issue that the, the, and a client satisfaction issue because I just made their job more difficult. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these little training things that I've realized we've kind of missed. So we're, we're, we're trying to fix and work back on. So you have to always be aware of those things. Go back and fix the stuff you missed. Offload the stuff that you're not the best at. And then really stay focused on what you're good at. And the last thing I'll say, because it's just like, I've been an attorney for so long, billing by the hour, you know, I did it for like 15 years. So I can talk forever. So, <laughs> so the last thing I will say is with a, with, as you're growing in a company, and I don't care if you're hiring your first employee, your fifth or 50th, hundredth, whatever, is it really is the people that make the difference. It's probably my number one message here. And so like, like my time besides like strategy and like my day is also recruiting. Like even yesterday, I took a phone call with a very close friend of mine who I really respect because I'm looking for a top level person. And I asked him, who do you know? He lives in an area of a, so I'm trying to recruit from I'm like, who do you know? And I've got like two awesome candidates and I'm like, perfect. And this guy was like, oh my gosh, if I was starting a business, this is the person I would hire. Wow. I'm like, perfect. I'm not going to get that on an Indeed post. That's amazing because hiring the right people, it builds that culture of excellence too in your team. And when you have excellence around you, that's just going, it's contagious, you know, it's, so it keeps you as the main leader yeah. on your A game because you have a lot of people on their A game counting on you. Yeah. And it elevates everyone else. Mm -hmm. that's already there mm -hmm. or the people that are already there and are A players. They're like another A players coming. Even their level goes up a little bit because they're like, okay. <laughs> And I've seen that too. It's, it's actually cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, Matt, I know I feel like I have a million more questions. I'll have to have you back on the podcast later, but where can people find you um, if they want to just learn from you? Okay. So mattsorensen.com. That's with one T, M-A-T, Sorensen, S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N.com. That's my handle on most of my social media as well, Instagram, YouTube. And then Directed IRA is our company where we handle IRA accounts that can invest in real estate. You don't have to just buy crappy stocks, bonds, and mutual funds and be in the stock market. You can own real estate or private companies or startups, whatever you, you're, you're into. Um, and then our law firm, KQS Lawyers, that's simply kqslawyers.com. Forward slash craft. <laughs> you are affiliate. Yeah. Yeah. You got to throw in your link for that. But, and I want to point out if video. people don't have an IRA set up, they can go directly yeah. to you guys and you will get one set up for them. Yes. Yes. So a lot of people, you could start with zero. You don't have any IRA at all, but mm -hmm. you're interested in real estate. You could start with us. Most people have like a rollover or transfer that come to us. So for example, you've got an old employer 401k at Fidelity, or you've got an IRA you've had for a decade at TD Ameritrade, and you're just overdoing stocks and mutual funds. You can just transfer or roll that over to an account at Directed IRA. And our team takes care of that. So if you just go to directedira.com, they can, you can schedule an appointment. I think we, we can give a link, your link actually yeah, it'll be uh, on how to notes. book that. Yeah. Perfect. And then so go to that link because you get a discount and then you can switch to a free call with someone on our team and they'll walk you through it. Awesome. Yeah. And just from personal experience, one of my newest uh, private money lenders that's coming into one of my flips is using his company right now. So she's had an amazing experience. So I know all of you guys listening in right now will have the same. Good as well. So Matt, awesome. thank you so much for being on the show and just teaching. We talked about a lot of different subjects from parenting to real estate and then team building. And so I know people are really going to absolutely love it. If you guys learned anything from this episode, which you better have, take a screenshot, tag both me and Matt on wherever you're listening to this um, and wherever you like to hang out on social media, make sure to post about us and just share the love with everybody. Matt, thank you so much for the work you're doing in the world and for not keeping it to yourself, for taking the time to go and put it out there and help people, you know, build generational wealth for their families. Yeah. Loved it. Thanks so much, Caleb. Love being on. <laughs> <laughs>